Hello, Dr. Monica Amadio. Welcome to the Doing CX Right Show. Thank you. So great to be here with you, Stacey. I appreciate it. I am so excited for our conversation because it's different than many of the other shows in that we're digging into entrepreneurs and the education system. And so there's a lot to tap into here. Before we go forward, though, please tell my audience, who are you? What do you do for a living? Well, my name is Monica Amadio. I've been an educator for more than 25 years. On top of that, I'm a small business owner, uh, owned a number of different businesses in a lot of different sectors. And I teach or have taught at both the uh, high school, the career technical education, and the university level uh, full-time for a number of years. Mm. So beyond that, I write for Inc. Magazine and do a, a bunch of consulting. I am a philanthropist, you could say, and an active board member. So those are things that I bet a lot of people can read and find about you. Tell us something that people might not know about you. Mm. So um, fun fact, I guess, right, as you refer to it uh, in the past, is that um, my family was, and my husband and I, for our business, uh, Discovery Channel came out and made a pilot show about our family. And... uh, one of our small businesses as entrepreneurs. That is definitely a fun fact. And (laughs) you'll have to share that with me if it's watchable. (laughs) Yeah, everything, uh, you know, all PG. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. That is really good. I love that. That's awesome. And let me ask you a question that I ask everybody on my show, 125 episodes and it's such a great question. I it, Someday I'll have to go into a podcast just on this question. But if you could go back in time to your younger 20-year-old self based on what you know now that you didn't know then, what would you say to the younger Monica? I have a number of, of streams of advice, right? Streams of consciousness that I would share with my younger self. Um, and they come from different sources, right? So Me personally, I would say travel as much as you can, get as much education as you can before you have kids, uh, before you have commitments. I think oftentimes when we're young, we don't realize how free we are until all of a sudden we aren't, right? So I would say do all of those things, experience, take big risk, uh, and even fail big. My second follow-up to that is persevere. Do not quit, don't pivot, persevere and and see things through um, because although things seem difficult at the time, uh, the advice that I've received from doing even my dissertation work is uh, you have to push through those barriers. And I, I wrote about that, in fact, um, for Inc. Online, Inc. Magazine about uh, there's one called the pikefish and the story of the pikefish who, who doesn't persevere and um, why that's so important for entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs especially, but young people too. Yeah. And young people, I believe right now, I have young adult uh, kids. I don't, I can't, I can't say kids. They're not kids and they're not full adults. I guess they are. I don't know. But they are really a, a generation of entrepreneurs wanting to start their own business and so what you're doing is really uh, very relevant, especially for the times now. Absolutely. I mean, so in our area, we saw there was a huge push, I would say, in the, in the um, you know, last century to, to have entrepreneurship in our area. The huge growth from the, the founding of the area until the mid, early, uh, I would say 1990s, 1980s, We had a lot of big industry come in as one specific hospitality-related industry in in southern New Jersey in particular, and um, it shifted the dynamic regarding entrepreneurship. And now we're seeing huge waves of both uh, people, adults and young young people, 
Uh, as as young as middle school, I had someone last night telling me about their sixth grader who had a business. Uh, my my um, youngest, when she was 12, had an online business during COVID. So there's this wave of new entrepreneurs uh, and people that are seeking to have that kind of lifestyle and learn more about how to have their own business, start and run their own business and be self-sufficient outside of the confines of what we consider work. Yeah. So let's get into customer experience and doing it right. Can you tell me from your perspective, what does that mean in in the small business world? From the uh, uh, really basic and personal level, I would say knowing your customers, right? And interacting with them. So as a small business owner, we made an enormous effort in our first business, I would say, to know individually our customers. And that advice came to us by someone who was much more seasoned and much more successful than us. We knew our customers by name. I know that's not always possible, but we made the specific intention to do that. And we were able to exit that business a handful of years later for a multiple of the value that we had paid because... Um, of the customer relationships that we built over a long period of time. So for me, uh, that as a business owner, I say it's the relationships of knowing your customers and serving their needs, whatever their needs are, um, that you actually seek to do. Mm -hmm. As a consumer, I would say having your needs met, right? So recently I had an experience at uh, Best Buy, believe it or not, in my area, that was fantastic. They resolved my problem right away. And I wrote about that for Inc. as well. So if you read that article um, recently mm. published, you will you can uh, see the chronicles of my experience there and, and just phenomenal customer service on that day. So what did Best Buy, which is a big company, and normally I have large companies on my show, but what did they do right that's transferable to small businesses and entrepreneurs? So um, my, from my experience there, and again, um, I don't know that there, that experience translates into every, every experience in every location, but I can tell you that the things that I, that I saw uh, that they did right, and that is they greeted me right away. Nice, warm, friendly greeting. Um, nothing fancy. They weren't trying to put on airs or, or show off. Just honest, genuine, uh, you know, how you doing? Talking about the day and um, asked what my situation was. I explained uh, the situation that I had ordered this laptop. It, it um, arrived broken. It was dysfunctional. And they immediately knew what to do to take care of it. The manager arrived within two minutes. Uh, he had someone run to the back, get a new one brought it up to me and swapped it out in very quickly. So they they greeted me warmly. They understood my situation. They responded to that situation with the easiest solution that they could have offered. And it was the best solution. Um, when I went in there, I was not expecting to have that kind of uh, response. You know, I, I told them, I walked, I actually walked out to my car and I walked back and I said, you know, I think this was easier than like returning bad fruit at the grocery store. Like the, the, <laughs> it was faster and it was just wonderful. They, they exceeded my expectations and then they thanked me for being a customer. So all of those things in a literally a seven minute interaction have caused me to believe that customer service, that is the way to do customer service right. All of those are transferable to small business as well. So you greet your customers. Again, you know your customers, you understand their needs, you meet their needs, you fulfill, uh, and you thank them for being a customer and you ask them to come back. So they made it easy for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they left a great lasting impression on you. They didn't yeah. make excuses, right? Right. They did the basics right. Hello and thank you. Like this is the basics. That's what I really want to emphasize here, <laughs> right? <laughs> because so many companies, I don't care what size, are overthinking customer experience, and they're thinking about like 
how much expense might be involved to give focus to customer experience, but really listening to what your story is. And there's hundreds more. Yes. I want people to realize how much CX is in our control. Yes, it is. It absolutely comes down to the individual and yeah. um, the personal relationship and the personal experience. So now in the education system, you might say that the students are the customer. Well, this, so this also has a lot of carryover for education. I believe that there are multiple stakeholders in education, right? So, so there's actually more than one set of customers. You have the, uh, the staff and the faculty. So the teachers are direct reports, right? So you engaging them and making the educators and the staff feel uh, supported and seen and recognized and appreciated is so important because you are relying on them to transfer knowledge and and excitement about different topics, you know, all different topics, whatever subject area they're an expert of, and they're hired because they are an expert in that area, they can teach pretty capably, but their level of excitement will grow exponentially as they feel supported by <laughs> the 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 organization and the people that they work for and with and uh that excitement i can tell you that enthusiasm for their subject is absolutely contagious and beyond that connecting students with um uh, people that are professionals in the workplace has shown with statistical significance through the research that those connections uh, really carry over into meaningful ways for students, graduation rates and employment mm -hmm. and lifetime earnings. Oh, that's so good. I mean, that is, oh, I have to breathe and think through that because it, it emphasizes everything. I've always been saying how everybody internally has a CX job. <laughs> They have to own the experience. And a lot of times I'll talk to people and they'll say, no, I, I don't. I'm not the front line or I don't have that job. And I'm like, let's sit down. Let me explain. And you just articulated that so well in the education system that you might say, well, that's not corporate business. But guess what? You're creating experiences that pay it forward and, and so on. So love what you just said. Let's drill into the heart of customer experience, which has a lot to do with communication. What's your view on communication in the education system and the impacts of when you do it right or not? So as uh, in the stories that we discussed that I had mentioned earlier and thousands of others that we could tell, we find that communication is, like you said, the heart of customer service, right? So whether it's online or in person or on the phone or by email, those, the tone, the style, the method matters. The words and the intention matter, right? And so, or the lack, I can tell you, the lack of words or the, the indifference also matters, uh, on the negative side. So we have both sides of the coin. As an educator in um, that's connected to both high school education and college university level education, I can tell you that we are specifically setting aside efforts to improve communication among students. Oral, written, and in-person, peer-to-peer. So there's a huge push for students asking other students questions um, and high-level questions, holding other students accountable, engaging each other. And I feel that that's really key now coming in after COVID when students were so isolated and they were, they were um, so separated from each other that they did not get to practice those skills in middle school or in high school, if we're talking about the university. And so students have told me repeatedly that they appreciate 
the time that we take to do things like um, mock interviews, where they interview each other, they get to play both sides, Mm -hmm. and presentations, group work, communication. Those are all critical skills that they will need in the workplace and specifically skills that they will need in customer service. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're reminding me when I have worked with contact center agents, learning and development is a huge function in companies. And it's the same thing. They want to feel valued. They want to be supported and they want to be trained not just one time, (laughs) right? And they want the peer-to-peer community. So it's exactly whether you're in high school or an adult doing customer service, it's the same human need. Yeah. So to to your point, um, the president of Stockton University, Joe Bertolino, he recently gave the State of the University address. And in that, he specifically spoke to the, the staff, the faculty, and the students and said that he wants everyone connected to Stockton University to feel seen and feel heard. And I found that to have such positive impact because that's really what we want as individuals, right? When someone comes in with an issue or calls a call center, they want to be heard. They, yeah. When I walked into Best Buy, I wanted my issue resolved. I wanted to be seen. Had three people walk by and not address me, I would be miserable. <laughs> but even waiting, uh, you know, in line at the deli, like you just want someone to say, just a minute, ma'am, you know, or you, you want to be acknowledged. So that's that's exponentially true in places where we spend eight hours a day. If you're a student, you know, uh, how much time do you spend in your workplace? So if you consistently feel that your ideas are heard and that you as an individual are seen and recognized and not to mention celebrated, then um, you will do so much more and, and it will create have this ripple effect of positive outcomes for the entire organization for decades. Yeah, so two comments to what you said. One is, in terms of the education system, if people, hopefully in the university, might be listening to this, the fact that if a student needs help registering for a course or needs to change their curriculum or a, maybe a parent paying the bill or right, or themselves paying the bill and they can't get the help, that they might switch universities if it's just not going well and they're struggling. So it's not just the content and it's not just the teachers. It's literally the operations. If it's not going easy, a level of effort like Best Buy there's a real impact there. So one comment to that. The other thing is communication and what you talked about. So for entrepreneurs, um, I think it's important that they realize that if they have any staff, if they have contractors, if they have interns, if you're a solopreneur, you're a virtual assistant, like this is all applicable. I want to mitigate anyone saying, well, I don't have a team, but you know what? You have partners. (laughs) Yes. You, you know, it is, um, no one works alone, right? (laughs) Regardless of what you do, an author, uh, uh, you know, someone podcasting or you have um, people that you will seek support from. So in my dissertation research um, and my publications, I was able to interview high achieving women entrepreneurs in tech. I don't think we got to talk about this one, but they, these are women that are just doing phenomenal jobs. So they are in the most challenging industries. They had benchmark earnings. um, So they were in the millions of dollars and they were in cybersecurity, AI, retail, consulting, DEI and others. It was fantastic study to learn from these women. And they all said the same thing as a place to start, and that is align support. So we ended up coming up with a framework um, developed around that, that we're looking to publish about how women can um, achieve great things 
through entrepreneurship, but even through side hustles or uh, in a corporate life that allow them to um, to really excel and use their skills. And, and the number one thing was aligned support. So I agree with you that it doesn't matter even if you are a solopreneur or an entrepreneur, you absolutely uh, want to make others feel seen and heard that are around you. And I often tell my own children this, and I'll share it here, is that, and we've heard it before, it's um, very famous, you know, saying, is that it's all about how you make others feel. Yeah, absolutely. Now, AI, <laughs> talk about feelings or, or lack of robots, AI. Tell me, where does that fit in the education system? And how is that affecting customer experience and service from your perspective? So if I can give you a little bit of context on my answer, because um, I have some experience with this. I teach at the University of Capstone Technology and Innovation course. It is a writing intensive course. So I have to uh, judge the quality and quantity of the student work. At the same time, I am actually responsible for preparing these students who will be managers in the workplace for as technology leaders, right? So what technology do they need to know how to use effectively and proficiently and train others how to use that makes them successful in the workplace? A top commodity, if you will, mm -hmm. as in human resources. At the same time, how do I know that they're good writers without cheating the system? Yes. <laughs> so That's every parent and every teacher thought, I bet. <laughs> I can tell you, uh, we we do. We have a number of strategies. I'm happy to uh, share them with anyone who would like to reach out. I would suggest uh, LinkedIn and um, happy to consult. I've received a number of calls about that to share some training and some tools and what we're doing and what the research says we should do. I'm also part of the AI committee and the uh, Information Technology Committee at the university and um, one for uh, our local high school as well and our county high schools. So there's a lot of talk about this. In fact, um, the, who, the LA Unified School District came out with an announcement that they were launching a tool that they ironically called Ed, and I love the name, is that it's an AI tool that helps interact with parents and students to help parents when they get stuck with student homework, to help students know what they need to do. And it is um, targeted towards the most vulnerable or, or underserved populations in, in that district, which is by alone very huge, right? So they, they service um, a huge population in Los Angeles. And I applaud their effort for using the technology and for changing the game for educators, really setting the bar for how what we're permitted to do, right? And I use that term permitted because in many districts, particularly K-12 districts across the country, AI is absolutely banned be, for fear of not knowing how to use it or how to control it. Yet students, every most students have access on their cell phone and have their cell phone in their pocket. So the reality is that while you don't have access on a school computer, the students individually have access. And so how do you how do you how do we really transform the culture and communication dialogue around this new platform and, and then the new access that we have to these platforms? I shouldn't say the platform is new. The technology isn't actually that new, but the public access to it is. And that's really where we're having those conversations on what is the highest and best use, what's ethical for students, mm -hmm. and how do we teach students who will soon be part of the workplace how to use these tools effectively and efficiently so that they can be efficient and effective in the workplace, right? So what's highest and best use? Again, if anyone would like to reach out, I'd be happy to communicate with them. I could speak for hours on this. <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to have an encore uh, episode after the show. So um, we're going to dig into that. 
So don't lose those thoughts. When I say leadership, what is the best leadership advice that you've received or given? Well, when I was in my doctoral program, which was about organizational leadership, I'm looking for a pen because I'm going to draw you a picture. My friend Deepa worked for a company. She was one of the lead trainers for a company, an uh, international company with more than 160,000 employees. Very knowledgeable, well-read, super informed, great consultant. She drew this picture for me and I'm going to share it with you. Can't see it. Okay. okay. And for those oh. listening, it'll be on YouTube. It's a dot in the middle of a blank page. And she held it up and she said, what do you see? I, everyone in the room said a dot. She said, that's because we only focus on the problem. <laughs> we don't see everything else that's good. We mm -hmm. only see ev the, the issue, right? So uh, if you focus on everything else that's good, the issue all of a sudden becomes so small right? This little dot in the middle of this massive page. And she, at the time, she used this wall-sized post-it note. So I, I would say, focus on the good. Oh, that is so good. <laughs> I will absolutely be sharing this on my social as a clips because I want people to see what you just drew and how basic it is and yet how eye-opening it is. And that's really about customer experience too. It's so simple, but we overcomplicate it. And so that is a great way to wrap up <laughs> the dot on the page. And it makes so much sense. My last question, what is the one thing you want people to remember about doing customer experience right? I should say, what's a tactic? What's one thing they can go do whether they're in the education system, whether they're a small business, starting a business, or a leader in a big company, what can they go do to make it better? Honestly, the most simple, learn people's names. Oh. Learning names, both in education and in business, has changed the game for me. The fact that I can walk into a room of 60 students and call them by name uh, or or you know, refer to their life outside of the classroom um, is remarkable to them, right? So they feel seen. Uh, my customers in every business we've owned, I could see them by name. I could see them at the store. They became friends. We had a relationship. They wouldn't go to a competitor because of our relationship. And so I think it builds value in business. It builds value in corporations. It builds value in education, both to students and to faculty, when they feel seen and heard, if uh, someone of authority or an administrator calls them by name and greets them in passing as well. So, Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for the gift of you today. And I really appreciate it. And I'm going to put all your contact information, uh, socials in the show notes so people can find you. And uh, so excited for further conversation. So, Thank you again. Thank you. It was my pleasure.